Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshops, where we get together in the middle of the week to learn more about technology. This is the third Wednesday of the month, and that usually means, and it is, time for learning more about Linux. Our team includes Orv Beach, Cal Elsnault, Dave Melton, and myself. Yep, that's four of us. And we have with us Bill James as our co-host and Judy Talour as our question lady. Today, we're going to be doing things about networking. Now, I'll preface by saying that we've had people say we want to know more about networking in Linux, but then they really don't go anything beyond that. And that's kind of a huge uh, topic. So the team said, well, here's what we think they might want to know and learn about. So hopefully what we do is what will interest you and educate you. And at the end, if we didn't answer some of your questions, you can ask those at the end and we'll see if we can help you with that. Our procedure today is going to be, we're going to break it up into three groups. Orb's going to start out and talk about a background, the basics. I call it LN101102, Linux networking. And he's going to be taking us from the beginning and helping us understand a lot about what is involved in networking. Dave Melton is going to be showing us how he's been able to connect uh, from one computer to another computer um, through Samba so that you can be able to do Windows and Linux and whatever. And then I'm going to share a number of GUI, graphical user interface programs that I use and you could use in able to connect to your computers over your network and share files. And then after that, we'll open it up and see what's there. So we're going to start out today with Orv and um, Orv's from California, Dave's from California, Cal's from Louisiana, and I'm the only guy from the East. So uh, uh, we hope you enjoy what we're doing. And Dave, it's all, I mean, <laughs> Orv, it's all yours. All right. Uh, let me uh, find the right screen here. Uh, let me minimize that. There we go. How's that? I can see networking under Linux. Good. Um, this is going to be an overview of uh, networking basics. Um, this applies to every computer that's got a network connection, not just Linux. We're going to look over uh, an IP address, a net mask, a gateway, what they are, domain name services, and a brief overview of uh, network management using a GUI and a command line interface. Um, if you only have one computer in your house, it's almost certainly running DHCP, Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Um, when it wakes up, it doesn't know anything about its uh, network configuration, and it sends, sends out an, a DHCP request out on the network. And typically, your home router uh, is running a DHCP server listening for those requests, and it has a block of pre-configured IP addresses it can hand out. Uh, in addition to um, the IP address it hands out, uh, the bare minimum it has to send also is the net mask and gateway, and we'll talk about those. So um, we're going to talk about IPv4, Internet Protocol version 4. Um, there is an IPv6 out there. Um, the reason it came about is because they foresaw running out of IPv4 addresses, which we, we technically did about a year and a half ago. So the IPv6 is... Um, designed for <laughs> lots of addresses. <laughs> I think they said uh, this is like one address for every, I don't know, grain of sand in the world or something like that is ridiculous. Um, if you ask for IPv6 uh, addresses at home and you'll get your own unique one, you'll get 64,000 addresses. Uh, but we won't be talking about IPv6 because almost nobody runs it at home. So anyway, uh, on the left here, you can see an IPv4 address and they call it dotted decimal notations. 
those aren't periods in between, they're called dots. And 172.16, you know, like that. Um, MAC addresses and IPv6 addresses use colon notation. There's colons in between. So anyway, uh, left to right, you can see four numbers. Um, they are bytes, and you'll occasionally hear them referred to as octets. Um, with eight bits, each one of those numbers can re represent in decimal up to 255. In other words, uh, eight ones is 255. So um, part of it, starting from the left-hand digit, is the network address, and it doesn't change. Um, the very last byte, last octet, will change, and that will be the address assigned to that specific computer or network device. You know, it could be a, uh, I don't know, a, <laughs> a smart thermostat or something. Um, the network address will change in width depending on the size of the network, the class of the network, but typically at home, um, the three left-hand uh, bytes will be your network address and won't ever change. Oh, the net mask. How to explain the net mask? Um, you can see, well, it's good. let's start from the bottom, the class C address, 192.168.1. Um, a class C address, only the lower byte can change, which means in your home, if you're running a class C network, which all of us are, uh, that last byte can vary from zero to 255. And typically, you only have 253 addresses usable. That's because when the network, uh, when the when the host ad the host address can't be zero and it can't be all ones because those are used for other network functions. So typically, 254, and your DHCP server will be configured to hand out, I don't know, 100 of them or something like that. You can go in and look at it and change it. Uh, be careful of breakage, though. So only a class C address, only the right-hand most uh, octet can change. That gives you 255. Moving up from there is a class B address, where um, uh, the right-hand two uh, uh, bytes can change. And above that, the class A, all but the left-hand most one can change. And what the subnet mask is, it Oh, looking at the class A address, the subnet mask starts with 255. 255 is eight ones, and those eight ones indicate that that bit and that byte will never change. In other words, that's the part of the, that's the network address. Um, in this case, it's 10. Um, the three we're showing, 10 dot whatever, 172 and 192, are called private addresses. In other words, because they're reused, every household runs 192, 168 dot something, um, those cannot be broadcast out on the network because if everybody uses it, you can't send it to a specific address. Anything different from that, like uh, 90.16.5.2, those are public addresses and those are routable. You'll see things like that on the uh, outside of your router if you've ever looked at that. All in, everything out on the internet has a private address because it has to be routable. I probably over explained that, but I hope you get the idea. Um, <laughs> now for even more confusion, um, the network mask is gradually, it's still used, but more and more you'll see CIDR, uh, Classless Internet Domain Routing. Um, if you look at the uh, table on the right, go down to, um, oh, the bottom one, um, 255, 255.00. Size of the uh, class C is 256 addresses. That is what we would call a class C. Um, but um, you would see um, uh, the network and then a slash 16 after it, indicating uh, it was the full class C. And as that number after the slash gets larger, means more and more of the network address bits are allocated to the, this is complicated, I know, uh, are allocated to the 
network address and fewer and fewer to the host. In other words, in my uh, uh, ham radio network, and I'll show you that, uh, it's a slash 28 network. So I only have 16 hosts in there and that's done deliberately. I'll, I'll show you. You probably don't need to worry about that, but when you see the slash after a network address, that is the network mask in CIDR format. So anyway, um, when a computer, for instance, in this example has 192.168.0.10 on the lower left, computer one, needs to talk to computer two at 192.168.0.11, it knows it's in the same subnet, so it can send directly to it. It just sends to that IP address and poof, you're done. If computer one has to send to an IP address that's not in the subnet, it has to know where to send it. And that's the default gateway. In other words, if it can't send it directly, send it to the gateway. And the gateway has to deal with getting it out of your house. So computers use IP addresses. People don't. Um, people refer to hosts, servers out on the internet by their host name, amazon.com, whatever. Um, when you tell your browser to go to www.example.com, it has no clue where that is. But it knows who to ask, and that's its domain name server, the DNS server. It sends out a, who the heck is this? And the DNS server says, it's this IP address. In this case, 1245.56.67. Now, in your house, your default DNS server is your router. And it will cache or store recently used uh, uh, host names and their uh, corresponding uh, IP address. If it doesn't know about it, it will kick it upstairs to the next higher level of DNS server, which is typically your um, ISP, your internet service provider. If it does not know who it is, it kicks it up a higher level. And then it works its way back down when it finds a, 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 a DNS server that can respond with the requested information. Um, if it gets all the way to the top and doesn't work, you're it'll send back, sorry, you're out of luck and your browser will say uh, not found. And all of that stuff is well and good if you're running DHCP, you don't need to worry about it. But if you have two computers you need to communicate with in between, then you need to know how to configure them and how to find them out. Now, Remember, I said those computers can talk to each other directly because they're on the same subnet, but you need to know the IP address. Um, and by the way, um, nowadays, DHCP servers are smart enough that when they get a DHCP request, they record the MAC address, the hardware address of the uh, network interface that requested it, they record it, and they will always hand out the same IP address um, uh, to that same computer. So generally it won't change. Um, I'm not sure whether all of them will retain those over a router reset or not. So just be aware that it might occasionally change. So anyway, um, John's going to go over this stuff in more detail, um, but in GNOME, um, up in the upper right hand corner, you can see the, the funny uh, network graphic and if you click on that you get this this happens to be an example of a uh, wired interface and there's all sorts of good information um, from top to bottom um, nowadays ethernet interfaces can negotiate speed uh, all modern stuff will do a thousand megabits per second uh, older gear will do a hundred really old gear will do 10 and it will either be full duplex send and receive simultaneously or very rarely now, half duplex, I can only send and receive uh, inter alternately. Um, uh, and you'll see some of that information in, in other network tools. In any, any case, this link speed was negotiated between two hardware network interfaces, Ethernet ports. This doesn't have anything to do with IP. The network link speed is just the link speed on that wire. So anyway, it's got an address. You can see it's got a class A address, 10.1.1.84. .1 .1 
And you can see the uh, IPv6 address underneath it, below it. And below that is the MAC address, the hardware address. Um, the hardware address doesn't change. It's assigned to that piece of hardware. You can see there are one, two, three, four, five, six bytes. The three left-hand bytes um, are occasionally referred to as the hardware cookie. Um, those are specific to a hardware vendor. And over years, companies consolidate. So if you go do a MAC address lookup, you'll notice that it could be, um, it will roll up to the current owning company. And you can see the default route. Default route and default gateway are the same thing. If you don't know where to send it, send it here. And then this in this case, it's 10.1.1.1. .1 .1. Uh, down here, you'll uh, below that, you'll see the DNS addresses, and there's two of them, uh, primary and secondary. Um, typically, your your DNS server will be your the same as your gateway server at home, um, uh, because it it <laughs> that little box actually is multiple functions. It's a modem, it's a firewall, it's a router, it's a DHCP server, it's a DNS server. Uh, Twenty years ago, that would be you know, three or four boxes filling half a rack, uh, the wonders of modern, modern electronics. Um, so your your default gateway and default router would be not 192.168.1. something or dot zero dot something, or in some cases, 255. dot something. In this case, you'll see it's 8.8.8.8 and 8.8.4.4. Those are uh, Google's public domain name servers. And there are advantages to using those. Um, there are a couple other um, uh, public DNS servers freely available, and I didn't look them up, sorry. Um, and their claim to fame is, uh, you know, very fast lookups, other stuff like that. Uh, a couple of other checksums down there, connect automatically. Well, yeah, you want it to connect automatically and get configured when it boots up. Make available to other users just means, I think, that this can be connected from other uh, IP addresses on that subnet. Now, this is GNOME, and this happens to be KDE Plasma. It's not nearly as colorful, but this is a screenshot. And you can see on the left, I've connected to the wired connection. Um, <coughs> and uh, under IPv4, uh, I've decided to do it manually. And you can see I've assigned an address to it of 10.95.109.117. That's because this particular computer is connected to my ham radio network, which is in kind of parallel, but separate from our home network. Um, and you can see the net mask does not end in zero. It ends in 250, which means I have 16 separate addresses to assign on uh, my ham radio network. And there are uh, Raspberry Pis and cameras and stuff like that. I think I've used about eight of them. And up there, the DNS server is 8.8.8.8. .8 That's actually incorrect uh, for this. This was an example I threw together. Um, the DNS server would be the same as the gateway, 10.95.109.97. Uh, but in any case, um, DHCP is good. Um, it's it's it generally trouble-free. Uh, the only issue is figuring out what the IP address is um, of the remote uh, server. If you can get onto it with a keyboard and a monitor, you can figure it out. But if it's something like a, a headless uh, Raspberry Pi that's acting as a server, uh, you'll either have to hook a keyboard and a terminal to it or go into your router and look at its DHCP uh, IP leases. It'll tell you who has what. <laughs> and if you do that, you'll be amazed at how many devices in your household have IP addresses, like your phones, um, a thermostat, uh, TV, uh, Chromecast, it goes on and on and on. So it's good to know that these uh, resources are available. Um, here's a screenshot. This is a Linux machine. Um, not going to teach it today, but if you've been messing around with Linux for a while, you may be familiar with the commands if config to figure out what the uh, address is and netstat to figure out what the route is those are deprecated they're no they're they're still out there and available but they're not actively being supported they're being replaced by the ip command and it's ip and then a sub command to do all sorts of things and the the format's different but uh you're going to have to learn it <laughs> 
and I'm going to have to get more familiar with it because I'm going to have to train you on it to, on a follow on. Uh, so anyway, I did IP address here at the top and I highlighted it. This is the loopback. Every computer has a loopback network interface um, and it's always 127.0.0.1. I just thought I'd uh, highlight that for you. Down here, this is the name of the Ethernet interface. Yours will be different. Uh, old school was ETH0 um, uh, on uh, Linux. Nowadays, this depends on the slot, uh, the PCI slot that it's plugged into. Uh, and I'm not sure what the format is, but it doesn't change. It's just another name. And it gives all sorts of stats here. Um, this is the, uh, oops, sorry. My bad, let me go back. I can't highlight stuff here. <laughs> the uh, The internet interface is 10.95.109.100. Um, that was assigned by the DHCP server on my ham radio network. And you can see it's a slash 28. Um, I'm looking at here. Uh, right above it, link slash ether, that's the Mac interface, B04F13. And I have no idea which vendor that is. Um, down farther, you can see INET 6. That's the Internet 6 address that's defined. I think it's assigned uh, from the MAC address. I need to learn more about that. Sorry, I haven't needed to, and I've <laughs> studiously avoided breaking my brain learning it. Um, here's another IP route. You can abbreviate the, the subcommands. Um, says the first line is the default route is by 1095.109.97. The device is ENP3S0. That's the Ethernet interface that uh, all uh, uh, all network traffic is set out. Proto is the protocol is DHCP. And the metric is some number that rates the quality. And I'm not sure how it works. Sorry. And it, uh, just below that, it says if you want to send out... Um, the 10.0.0 slash 8 says that's the default gateway um, again via, via the same thing. It's pretty much the same. And I don't know what the other, oh, the 169 is the one I one unassigned. Uh, the 172, um, I must have some 172 addresses set out there. And it says you can get to them through the default gateway. John, that's all I'm going to do for now. Uh, we can do some follow-on with our questions. We had talked about the the uh, SFTP uh, uh, command, and uh, <laughs> I need to come up to speed if I'm going to give a presentation on that on uh, IP one oh IP uh, LN one oh two or something. Yeah. So you're not going to do any more demo on? I, I can. Well, it, if there are questions, I I, I don't. I don't have any questions. That was a good basic beginnings on that. Um, you did remind me that I was going to do a few other things today. Uh, when uh, when Orb showed you his uh, network settings uh, window, they're basically the same. He showed you two different ones, and I've got one that would be a little bit different because it would be a mate, uh, you know, screen, uh, but it basically has all that same information. Um, I guess maybe we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, assigning IPs a little bit later. We can because uh, I've got mine set up quite a little bit different than what uh, the standard person would do. So I think maybe what we'll do is uh, we'll move and on to Dave and let Dave share with his. He's he's a newer one to Linux, so that those people who are uh, new to Linux, uh, Dave is our team member that is that kind of guy. So he's been learning a lot. As as Orb said, he's had to learn some things because he's wanted to be able to do things. So uh, Dave, if you want to uh, take over things and share with us what you have about networking. Sure, I will, I will jump in and share here. And let's see what we get. I'm assuming you're seeing my share. I see network shares in Linux using Samba. 
There we go. So that's what I had in mind for you to see. So good morning, everybody. Uh, well, at least morning for me. So what I had in mind today was um, showing you how to share your files, pictures, folders, so on and so on between computers on your home network. Most of us probably have more than one computer and that's on our network. And by the way, that includes your phones and your tablets as well. And I've tested this a little bit with my phone. I'm not gonna show you that today because I can't share the screen on the phone. So um, what I'm going to do, uh, let, me, let me just start here is, um, we're, we're gonna try and go through, uh, uh, learn a little bit about what Samba is, and then I'm going to show you my network setup, and and then I have a few ideas of why I do this, and I will since I'm going to be using the command line today to do the configuration. Um, <clears throat> I was going to show you a little bit about what the command line looks like, and and most of you probably already know that anyway, and then I'm going to get into actually configuring it. Now, I, I um, the reason I'm using the command line is because I tried a little bit of, of doing this from a GUI, uh, like, like files in, in Mint, and I couldn't get it to work. So I gave up on that and went back to the command line. And I, I'm sure I'm doing something wrong, but I was not able to figure it out and I didn't want to spend more time doing that. So to, to, to install Samba, you, you also need to create a user and a group for that user to belong to so that your files are all shared as the same user and same group across your network. And then we're gonna test it and, um, um, and, and see what we see from our other computers. So here's a definition that I got from the web. I think it was from samba.org themselves as to what, what Samba is. And Samba is a derivative for, for, for Linux of the SMB protocol. You can see down here, SMB. Um, and then it stands for a server message block, which I think uh, was developed by Microsoft. Um, but anyway, this is the Samba, uh, the uh, Linux implementation of SMB, which allows you to connect computers together on your network. So <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of a review of my network, I have, as, as Orb was talking about, my network address is 192.168. 52, that's my server, I mean, my uh, network uh, uh, side of the configuration and zero to 255 are my hosts or computers, phones, thermostats and so forth that would all be assigned an address in my network. Now these, this subnet is changeable. Like you can see, I use 52 because I don't like using the standard that the router comes with. So I just changed the last, the, the third octet to 52, just picked it. Um, I also have internet connection, obviously. And as I mentioned, I have phones, Windows workstations, tablets, printers, game consoles, and so on, uh, with sprinkler controller, and people who, come by can get a, a guest IP address as well. And I've created a, an Ubuntu server, which is going to host my shares. And I have installed a Kubuntu workstation and a Mint workstation. All three of these computers are, are virtual machines on my network. And I've also installed SSH on the Ubuntu server so I can connect to it remotely. And I have SSH, an SSH client on my Windows workstation. So why have network shares? 
as I mentioned a little bit ago, you can share documents, um, movies, pictures, music, photos, whatever. And you can, and I do, use my network shares as uh, my own cloud by, you know, by having all these movies and pictures and so forth. Everybody has access to them. I also use it for making backups of my computers. And, and then, um, you know, I, I'm sure there's all kinds of other purposes, but that's how I use it currently. So um, those of you who have used the Linux command line will, will be familiar with the, with the dollar sign, which is the user prompt, or the pound sign, which is the root prompt. We'll be using, we'll be using the user prompt today. Um, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So um, with a little bit of background that I just gave you, uh, I didn't wanna to spend too much time with that because these steps take a little while. And uh, so here are my steps. Uh, and, and I'm going to go through them with you physically here. And I will share this screen, which is my Ubuntu server. Hopefully you can see that overlaid uh, uh, over the instructions there. Yes. Okay. All right, so what I've done here is <clears throat> this is a, an SSH connection. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm the user, not root. The pound sign is, is for root. Um, and I have, I have connected from my Windows computer to this machine um, right here, Ubuntu server is what I named it. And this is just the welcome screen from Ubuntu when you log into the machine. And just to point it out, since we've already been talking about IPv4, here's my IPv4 address for this machine. And a little different than Orb, my, mine is named ENS18, where his had a different name. And that's just, that's just by hardware and, and uh, <clears throat> Linux release. That, that gives you those different names. So as you can see, step number one, I'm not going to do, I'll show you the command, but I, I don't wanna run that because it takes a while to run. And so I'll, I'll just type in the command so you can see it. And sudo, um, since I'm logged in as Bob, as you can see here, um, sudo takes me to the root user. And then I will do I'll explain this in a second. So what I have here is I typed in three commands on one line. Sudo and Again, it changes me to root, and I did an app update, which gives me all the new um, cache, um, what do I want to call that, the, the locations, and updates all the, in this case, Ubuntu. Um, uh, what am I looking for, John? The, the um, uh, what it, Anyway, you're, going be, you're going to be checking all the repositories for anything. Yes, yeah, repositories. That was the word I couldn't think of, the repositories. So it's going to update all my repositories. And then the double ampersand here says, if that command runs okay, go ahead and run the next command. If it doesn't, quit. So assuming that it works, I put in sudo app upgrade. So once I've updated the repositories, then I wanna do upgrades for everything on the system. And then after that, I wanna do an auto remove and anything that got, as Orb put it, deprecated or changed or update, uh, uh, removed, I wanna actually physically remove it from the machine. So that um, this command runs well, when I initially ran it a few days ago, it ran for probably half an hour. So we're not gonna do that today. So I'm gonna cancel this. I just wanted you to see it. 
After that, now I'm ready to do step two, which is install Samba. Again, I want to switch to root APT, which is app, the application uh, uh, engine. And I'm going to run this command. And he's going to ask me for my password uh, that allows me to change to root. And as you can see, since that takes quite a while also, I've already installed Samba, but um, it ran and it said, oh, so it's already installed. So then I'm going to check it. So SMBD is how, how Samba installs itself. That is the service that runs Samba. So I will, I will now check it. And you should do this after installing Samba. And what you can see here is that it's active, running, and enabled. Enabled means that anytime you reboot this machine, Samba will start automatically or SMBD in this case, will start automatically, which will cause Samba to share its, its configuration with, with anybody on the network. Okay, so now what we need to do, since we're going to um, modify the configuration that comes standard with Samba, we need, I, I want to stop the Samba service from running. <clears throat> so what this does is it goes again I, I went to system control up here at, and did a status now we're going to stop the, the service so and it did so now if you look at status again you'll see that it's inactive, dead, but it's still enabled. So if I rebooted this machine right now, it would, it would uh, restart Samba for me. So at this point, now I'm ready to go and make changes to the configuration file that tells Samba um, what I want to share on my network. So I'm going to change directory and then we'll start from there. So you can see that when I installed Samba, it created a configuration file, smb.conf. So I, we'll, we'll just take a quick look at it. And you can see that this is the standard configuration that comes with Samba. Now there's a ton of stuff in here and, it, and it's great reference. And I don't expect you to be reading this stuff, uh, but th this is the default configuration that comes with, with the system, with the service. So what I'm going to do, since it's really good references, as I put in my notes here, I'm going to move it and save it. So, since I'm not in my home directory, I have to change to root. So move smb.conf to smb.conf. I, I don't know, I like calling it original. So now if we, if we do a, a, a display, you'll see I no longer have an smb.conf file, I have one called original. So if I started Samba right now, it would get an error because it doesn't have a configuration file. So rather than um, having you watch me type 50 lines of, of data, what I've done is I've created one already. And so I will copy it to here and then we'll go through it. So sudo again. So 
So what this is doing is copying a text file that I have created with the configuration of my Samba settings, and I'm going to rename it and copy it to this directory. So now if I do a LL, you'll see I have a smb.comp file, um, which is now ready for us to go look at. So we have to edit it. So here's the, here's the file I created. It only has 52 lines instead of 350 lines. And I just put some comments at the top here. Um, so what I'm telling you here is that this configuration is for a wide open share, meaning anybody that actually physically connects to my network at home will have access to the, to the data that, that's being shared. Whether you put something there, delete it, um, look at it, whatever you wanna do, edit it, it's, it's, it's available to anybody. So also, um, once you create this file, it's a good idea to run this command to test the configuration before you start Samba again. <clears throat> so there, in, in my case here, I have two sections that I've created. The, the global section is, is for the Samba server. It, it defines the server. So for instance, the server string, this is something you see when you log in. Shop Samba server is what I called it. My work group, it's called BirdNest. All my computers on my network um, are named after birds. So like my daughter's computer is called Falcon, for example. So I just chose a, a work group called BirdNest. <clears throat> now, in order for them to see one another, they need to be on the same, in the same work group. Um, then we go down to the next line. User level security is, is, is user. So this is, this is a very minimal amount of security but you, you have to, to find something in here for it all to work. Then we go down to the next line and uh, a, a valid user on the computer is what this is trying to say, is not necessary to use the shares. So that's defined as map to guest bad user. That's just the way Samba set it up. Then, um, Broadcast is what the client is broadcasting. So this is how, how Samba or your network resolves the names of the computers on your network. All of this stuff is probably a presentation all of its own, but just, um, you know, just this, this, is, this is working for me. So now I also, from reference on another website, found to have a little tiny bit of security, I, I put in a host allow. So anybody on my network will get a DHCP address in, in the range of 192.168, in my case, 52 dot something. And so if, if you broke into my network somehow, then you wouldn't have one of those IP addresses. So hopefully it, it puts a little bit of security uh, in here. And then also the other side of that, host deny is 0 .0 0 .0. So um, hopefully that helps a little bit. I, I didn't have a way to test that. Uh, I'm just assuming that the information is correct. Uh, now, <clears throat> now we go from the um, global settings down to the share itself. So I've called my share public. So that's what you'll see as the, as the person who connects from another computer, you'll see a share called public. And I happen to create a path called backslash shares backslash public. You can call this anything you want to. You can also put it anywhere you want to on your, on your server hard drive. Um, then the next step I did is I'm going to force a user called SMB user and the group called SMB group. 
which we have not created yet. That's a, a few more steps down here. And then I put in a little bit of information as to what um, the masks mean when you create a, a file or a directory. Um, <clears throat> these are obviously just comments. So when, when you create a file from, let's just say, Mint, it will get created as this user with this group with these permissions. And, and um, the permissions are, are defined here. The zero is what type of file it is, whether it's a directory or a regular file or a link. So in my case, all I cared about was the permissions themselves. So 664 says the owner has read and write access and the group has read and write access, but anybody else who's not part of these two groups has read only access. I, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Now the directory mask is a little bit different and it was explained to me in, in, in some website I went to that in order to create a directory from Windows on Samba, the directory has to have read, write, and execute for the owner, the group, and read, write, uh, uh, read and write for the, for the other person, or you won't be able to create a directory. All you'd be able to create is files. So I, this, this all works and, um, oh, I, I need to say that, that it's public because like, as I said at the beginning, this is available to anybody that joins my network. So public is, is just fine. And writable means that you can create these files with these permissions. So this is the, this is the new configuration file for my Samba server that we will create here in a moment. So I'm gonna save the file and exit and go on to the next command. David, let me just quick ask a question. Yeah, please. Because I can't. Did you create this file by editing the original Samba file? No, uh, uh, I, I should have covered that. I started from scratch. I, I, I looked at the original Samba file and it has those sections, but it had a whole lot more as well. So I didn't want all that other stuff. All I wanted was a share that I could uh, share files and folders with or in, if that makes sense. Yep. You can also, Samba also gives you the ability to share printers and, and several other things. And I, I wasn't interested in doing that. I, I wanted to keep it super simple. So all I, all, I, all I did is share a directory and allowed users on the network to access it. Okie doke. Yes. Okay. So now I'm going to create um, a user or actually a, a user group to that will have access to the shares that we will create shortly. So before I do that, I'm going to go to the uh, root directory, which if, if you remember in my in my uh, configuration file, my directory that I'm going to share is called slash share, right? So right now you'll see that if I do a LL, or you'll see that I don't have a directory called share here. It would be right in this area here somewhere. So we're going to create a, use, a group and a user and then create the folder or the directory to share. So I'm going to sudo again into root and <clears throat> oops, call it two Ds. So this is going to be a system group which means it doesn't need, it doesn't need any of the, the um, user kind of services like a, like a desktop or anything like that. So it's, it's used for system work. 
So we're gonna add a group called SMB group. And now we can do um, cat dash. Can't spell. So you can see down here at the bottom, SMB group. And the fact that it has a number of below a thousand, and again, this is another topic that I'm not covering, it means that it's a system group. So from now that I have a group, I can create a user. I'll explain this in a second. Okay, so what this command does is it's going to add a user. This user is going to be a system user. Minus M means do not create a home directory. Minus G, as you can see, makes sense that this is the group that this user is going to be added to. And for me, because I'm me, I created a comment saying disable login and no user home directory. And then minus S, and that is no login. This user won't have a login. And then the name, SMB user. So if I type it all correctly, this should come back and say, here you go. So if we do cat slash etc slash, this is where the users are all contained. You can see the bottom one here, SMB user. He's a system user because he's below a number below a thousand. His group name, his group number is 998. It's this, this is my comment, disable login, no user home directory. and home and, and it, this would be his directory but it doesn't exist and his login or or his his prompt would be bin false which doesn't which there is no such thing it would be bin bash is a normal user when a user gets created <clears throat> so now we have a user in a group and um, now we'll create the directories to be shared Pudo again, Oops, minus p slash share slash public. Now in my, in my configuration file, remember I created a share called share public and that's, no, I created the share called public and I told it it was in this location, share public. So we're gonna create this directory and it's created. So if I do, since we're in the root directory, as you can see here, if I do an LL now, you'll see now that we have a share directory and it is currently owned by root because I created it as root. Now, <clears throat> if you tried to log in from anywhere on the network, and add a file to it, you would see that it wouldn't work. Well, let's let's uh, try that. Slash share slash public dot text, and you'll see I'll get an error. Permission denied, and that again is because this folder or this directory share is owned by root. So now we're going to change that um, so that so that the use the uh, SMB user has access to it.
So you can see I typed in the username and then the group name. And now I'm going to type in the directory. And now if we look at it, you'll see that share is now owned by SMB user and SMB group. And I think I typed the name of the share folder incorrectly or the directory. We'd have to go back and look at my shares setup. Okay, so now we're, we're almost there. Yeah, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna move. Okay, I think I think that's correct. I just typed it wrong. Now now I'm gonna give the um, as you can see here, the it's a directory. Remember I, I said the, the bits were broken up into four four pieces that defines the type, like this one's a link right here. This one's a directory. And this one is a, a system file. So like this directory right now has the, the owner or the user has read and write and execute permissions, but the group has read and execute, no write. So I still could not put a file in there and other is just read and execute. So now I'm going to give the group read and write permissions to that folder of directory. So I'm changing, well, I don't need to change this one, but this one now is read, write, execute, which is a seven, a seven, and then a five, which is read and execute. So it, it, keep in mind the one that's highlighted there. And now if we do an LL again, you'll see that this one now, has, the group also has read, write, and execute permissions, and the other still is read and execute. <clears throat> Whoop, clicked on the wrong button. Shoot. How do I get back to that? Okay, oh, well, that sort of worked. So um, I now want to uh, test my parameters. Remember I had that comment in the configuration file, test parm, and now it's going to show us the configuration that we have set up. We have the security as user, the work group as bird nest, the shares is called shares public, and it's the force the user, uh, force the group SMB group, force user SMB user. So the fact that I didn't get an error message says that it that Samba liked the configuration. So now we'll start Samba over again. So we're starting the Samba service and we can look at it. And you can see it now active and, and running again. So we're, we're, we're just about ready to go here. Um, <clears throat> One more thing we need to do, in order to connect to it from any computer, we're gonna to need to know the IP address of the Samba computer. So as Orb pointed out, the command is IP and he put in address. So I believe the new shortcut is A. And we go down to my INET address and we can see that it is 114. So if I go over now to Mint, for example, let me let me open up Mint. Linux Mint.
and I go to files, which is Mint um, File Manager. If I did this correctly, let's see here, Mint, um, you can go to bookmarks and add a bookmark. Where did it go? Under bookmarks, home. I can edit that now, rename, shares. But I wanted to edit a bookmark. Can I edit it from here? Yeah, edit bookmarks. So shares, and I type in, that's going to be on 192.168.52.114. I think, and then I type in public. And I just said enter, I close. Now if I go to, oh, I got an error. Oh, no, it, it just didn't connect yet. So because I created it as a public share, and I hope you guys can all see the screen okay. I know it's kind of small. Um, I'm logging in as anonymous. So I'm gonna connect. And here's public on my Ubuntu server. So I, I can right click here and create a new folder. I'll just call it Mint. And you can see that it created it. So if I go back to my <clears throat> server here and I do uh, ll slash what so now we're looking at the directory that we just uh, opened up in mint we we now have a new folder called mint in that directory and it is owned by user SMB user and group of SMB group. Um, I also wanted to show you Kubuntu because it's a little bit different than Mint, of course. Lots of options in, in Linux. In Mint, I mean in, in Kubuntu, it, the file manager is called Dolphin. So this one's a little bit different. You go to in Dolphin, you go to remote and right click and add an entry. And I'm going to call it shares, just like I did on the other one. Is that the read it? Yeah. SMB. And click OK. So then we go to share. Did I type it wrong? Nope. Why doesn't it like it? Maybe you don't do it that way in Kubuntu. Oh, I, I, I typed it wrong. Edit it. Not shares. Okay, so now I can right click in there. Oh, let me, why not? And share, right click, create new folder. I'm gonna call it. So now we have a folder called Mint and Kubuntu created from two different machines. So again, if I go back to the server, <clears throat> and I do it a long list of public, we should now see two folders in there. Again, because I set up Samba user and Samba group, it was created as the Samba user and Samba group name. Um, one, let's see, I was going to show you from Windows also. I imagine that most of us still use Windows in one way or another. So I was going to show you here how to do that in Windows. So I can type in group 
Oops, I typed it wrong. So there's my public folder. If I open it, you'll see Ubuntu and Mint. So now we've accessed it from the Windows side and the Linux side, and I created a folder called Windows. And again, if I go back to my server, now you'll see I have three folders created. That's um, the simple way in Samba to create a publicly available um, network share. And I think that's pretty much all I have. Let's, let me look at my notes here. Yeah, that, that's really what I wanted to cover. I, I hope that um, some of this made sense to you and, and um, you could use it on your own home network if you have a, it doesn't have to be a separate server, by the way. You could do this on your own Linux machine and, and install Samba on your workstation and create a public share for anybody else on your network to use. Um, like I said at the beginning, I use this at home uh, to share with my, with my grandkids, my daughter, my wife, uh, and we share, uh, again, music and files and so forth. And I do backups uh, using this as well. So that's what I have. I can stop my share now, I guess. Yeah, that was, that was good because I was just going to ask you if you have to have a separate machine. Because if no. you do, I'm going to have to have a bigger table here. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you really don't need a separate machine. I just chose to use a separate machine because I, 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 I like it kind of in a, in a desktop slash server environment. Um, Ubuntu server, whether you like or hate Ubuntu, I, I, I don't know, but Ubuntu server comes up really, really quickly because it doesn't bring up a GUI interface or anything like that. The, the command prompt comes up in, in seconds um, when I fire it up. So it, because I don't need any of the other services, all I need is Samba running, it, it's really a fast machine, very small footprint. I, mean, I have I mean, a question. Okay. Do you use Samba, Samba to connect Linux to a NAS box on the local network? Do I use Samba to connect Linux to the a NAS box? No, those would be a, a NAS box is is very similar to Samba. You're, the NAS and as well as Samba are are serving the same function. Your, your NAS box is a place to, is a repository for all your, your files and folders and pictures and so forth, just like the Samba is. A, a Samba is another way of creating a NAS box, except you're creating it on your own instead I of buying one. Uh, you said it was your own cloud. Can it be accessed from Wi-Fi or outside your home? It can be accessed from Wi-Fi for sure, because anything Wi-Fi is on my network. So like I said earlier, I, I, I believe I, I shared that I have connected to it from my phone and it works fine. And obviously the phone is through Wi-Fi, but no, the way I set this one up, it is not accessible from the internet. Um, this might be something that uh, you want to answer in writing uh, that I can send out to everybody. But what problems did you run into attempting your process with the GUI Samba com configuration program? For those of us who are terminally, terminally challenged, this may be an obstacle too high. And this person also said, now I know why my in Samba install never worked. Okay. Um, well, I'm uh, may maybe they got some good information. The 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 GUI um, couple of videos that I watched 
had suggestions on how to connect it and it would automatically install Samba for you. Um, I tried it in Mint as well as Kubuntu and I could not get it to work the way the instructions were written. So I, I gave up. So I, I can't answer the question completely because it just, uh, the, the options that they were telling me to follow weren't there. Does that, does that make a little bit of sense? Yes, it does, because I often look up things and follow the instructions totally. I'm talking about Windows here. And what they say, it, it isn't there. And it I'm always there. wondering right. where in the world, or is this a thousand years old or whatever? So yes, that makes totally sense to me. Yeah, I, I tried um, uh, three different file managers in Linux because I wanted to create this the Samba server in Linux. And, and I, uh, the option that they used in, in the instructions I was trying to follow was not there. So I, I said, well, okay, I'll try a different file manager. That didn't work either. So I just said, okay, well, I guess we're not doing it that way. <laughs> Originally, I wanted to show that because it sounded like for most of us, that would be an easy way to go. It sounded awesome, but it didn't work. Uh, and uh FYI, with the poll from the Distro Watch uh, presentation, and today uh, I we have three new presentation ideas. Way cool! Oh, John Kennedy, you are on to introduce yourself. Okay, Dave, yes, you're sir. no longer the rookie anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that was uh, great. This brought, this brought me to a whole new stage, did it? Oh, it did. It did. I resign. You're in charge. All right. Um, so since I'm working on another computer and turning my head, I'm going to turn my video off because that drives me crazy when you're not looking at the screen. That was great. And I like it. I'm Thank into you. the yeah, I'm into the uh, command line and stuff like that. That I'm learning things from uh Orv and, and, and a few others. But I, I know that there are a number of people that says, I like something simple, easy to do. And so I'm gonna show today uh, a number of different ways that you can share files in your Linux network. You might be able to do it in the Windows, but I'm talking Linux. Uh, and then, you know, you have your choice. You can start with one and, and go to the other. Now, I wanted to be able to do some live demonstrations, but I'm not comfortable with the fact that I'm running the Zoom on my network. I am recording the Zoom on my network. And I think Zoom kind of doesn't like it when you're doing other things. So uh, to be safe, when I've done this before, uh, we're going to stick with the slideshow. And that way you can see everything, but we don't take the chance on it crashing, which it could do when you're trying to run remote inside of a remote. And I want to make sure you, you take note of the background so you know that this is this is my background for the next thing we do here. All right, so today we've been talking a, a lot about networking and we're not done yet because I'm sure that when I'm done and we get into some more things, there'll be other people that'll help educate and share with us. But I wanna kind of focus on the um, remote, file folder access between your computers. And I'm going to share some GUI programs or three GUI programs that pretty much are easy to work. If you can do your file manager, you can do this. We're going to talk about these programs and uh, I'm just going to touch on the SCP part because it's not a GUI. All right, we're gonna start out with Warpinator. And I will tell you that Warpinator is the uh, brainchild of uh, Mint. And I'm sure that uh, with open sourceness, it will be, <clears throat> if it hasn't, uh, it'll be coming out 
and available for all of uh, Linux users. And this is a program that will connect to any other Mint computers that you have on your network. Uh, but if it's not Mint, then we're going to do it a different way. When you open up the program, and you can have this set to automatically open up, Warpinator will automatically show you the other computers that it uh, detects. At the bottom, you can see that I'm on the laptop, which is what I'm on right now, but we're not going to do this live. And it says, hey, I've detected another Linux Mint, which is my tower on the other side of the room. If I had another one, uh, another uh, Mint set up and running, I would have a couple of lists uh, on here. So I select, if I had more than one, I would select the one I want to be uh, sending files to. And as you can see, it's moved up to the top. So uh, my new laptop, as I named it, is going to be able to send files to my tower. And on the right-hand side, there's a button that says send files. There is a recent one. So if you have a file that you've been recently working on, it might be on that list. You can click it or you browse. Now, I'm not going to show you a file manager. Everybody knows a file manager. And so you just use your file manager to find the files that you want to uh, move uh, switch over. I found the slide or found it in my ma the, the manager window, clicked on it, it added it to this screen. And so you can see I found an ODT file and I'm going to be uploading it. Notice the arrow over here at the left-hand side, uploading it to John at the tower. And right now it says it's waiting for approval. And the other computer then has to accept that uh, file that comes in. Now, I just did one, but you can do a number of files at one time. I need to send this one, this one, this one, this one, whatever. I just did one because it makes it quicker. Now, notice this is, says at the bottom, I'm on the new laptop. Now, notice at the bottom, I went over and took these screenshots of my tower and Warpinator, which is also running on that, says that, oh, John from the new lap has some files for you. And you can also see that over on the left-hand side, the arrow is pointing down. So that's saying it's downloading from John. They do a very good job of making it simple. And it lets me know that it's waiting for my approval. And on the right-hand side, I have two choices. I can check, click the check mark and get the file, or I can say, I don't want it and exit out. And then when that other computer, or after I've done that, it uh, shows me that that's complete. And it was a very, very fast transfer over my network for this file. It wasn't a big one, but it was there. And on the right-hand side, you can see the folder icon because even though it says it, it says that it was completed, that the file downloaded from my laptop to my tower. People don't always believe what they are told. So I can check my folder and I happen to have a folder called Warpinator. We'll talk about that. And you can see there's the file. And this is on my uh, desktop. So it was, it was that easy to send files and stuff over. And if we go back to my laptop, notice at the bottom, it says laptop. And it says that the file that I transferred over to my tower was complete. How can it get much easier than that? It's all the point and click. Find the file you want, add it to your list. <clears throat> then the other computer, when you go to it, you just say, yep, 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 and you got all your files. Sweet. And as I said, this right now is, is uh, in uh, Mint, and I'm sure it's going to move out. 
Now, in this preferences, just to show you what you can do, uh, of course, on the desktop, you can show an icon in the notification area. You can start this or start with the main window open. So that would have been the very first screen. And you can set it to automatically start every time the computer starts up. My, my answer to that or my comment on that is if you're going to use this a lot, you might want it to always be popped up ready to go. On the second line, uh, it says location for the receive files. It says Warpinator. Uh, that was their uh, suggestion. And what happens is that it automatically created the, the folder. But you can choose from a list of folders on yours. Uh, I can make a separate one for something else, but Warpinator made sense that that's where the files are going to come. So you can pick that. And you can require approval before accepting files, or if I don't want to have to get up and go to the other desk, I just send those. Now, the second one, or the next to last one, re require approval if it's going to be overwriting a file. Uh, you know, you might want to have that on because in case you've got that file already on your computer um, and this is an older one, you don't want to lose it out. And also, you can have a notice that if someone sends you or tries to send you files, let you know. In the connection, as, as um, Dave said under, under his with, with the uh, Samba sharing, you've got to have a group. And this one is uh, nicknamed Warpinator, but you can change it. <clears throat> we probably all would say, uh, always change it from the default that whatever the, with whatever your program says comes up with the default uh, change it because everybody knows that the group code for warpinator is warpinator and the default folder for files is warpinator so you know you can change that and the only thing i had to do uh, was this bottom part where the uh, update to firewall because your firewall as we have talked before, protects things from getting into your computer. And so Warpinator has some rules about uh, ports for your files. And at first, my laptop wasn't, uh, couldn't get somebody. Uh, the desktop saw the laptop, but the laptop couldn't see the desktop. <clears throat> once I made, I figured out, oh, I gotta update the rules. And once I updated the rules, then everything was fine and they see each other uh, every time. So that's, that's Warpinator, just too easy. Find a file, send it. Find a file, send it. Now, for people who don't have every computer, a Linux Mint computer, one of the things I use a lot for sharing files between my computers, because I'll use my desktop maybe to create today's presentation, but I'm showing it on the laptop. So I use pCloud. And of course, spell check change it. It's supposed to be a lowercase p and a capital C. I have to change that in there. Uh, I use pCloud because it has uh, all the features that I like. Uh, there's a free, uh, so a free version and I do pay for the lower version because I don't need you know, multiple terabytes of uh, storage space. So I use pCloud for, it's my backup program that automatically backs up my computers. Uh, and I use it for file sharing. I'm gonna show you how easy this one is as well. If you notice on the left-hand side, pCloud has an, a client that, installs on your computer. So it shows up as a device. So you can see that it's in my, excuse me, in, in my list of devices, which are just like my partitions. You can see I have a miscellaneous and an ISO box and, and a virtual box that I keep. So pCloud shows up right there. Also, if I go into my home, if I would go into, wrong screen, go into John, I would see the pCloud folder in John. 
Uh, I just haven't put it in this as a, uh, a bookmark type thing because it's right here. I don't need it. Now, so what I did was I went to my folder that, uh, sorry, I'm using wrong mouse on the wrong screen. Um, I'm, I'm using my uh, file manager and I moved to my screenshots folder and there's the folder of the Warpen, Warpenator presentation. And I say, I want to upload that. That's the one I want to and go to P Cloud. So all I'm gonna do is copy the folder into my P, P Cloud folder. And I just go up to um, view and I'm gonna teach you something else if you haven't done it. I do it a lot easier <clears throat> with, with a lot of Linuxes in file managers, they have the ability to have a second uh, uh, second pane on your computer. Right now, I just have one. So I'm going to go up to view and check the box for extra pane, or you can use the F3 shortcut on your computer and add the extra pane. And so then we'll get this way. <clears throat> so now I have two panes. On the left-hand side, this is my screenshots folder. And on the right-hand side, I'm going to navigate to my pCloud drive. And so you can see on here that uh, it doesn't show up on the left hand because that's just the default folders. But under my whole set of uh, home folders, there's pCloud. And so then I just go into pCloud. And so now I'm in my pCloud folder. I right-click on my folder that I want to switch over. And then I have other pane, copy to the other pane. And that simple, it copies it. I don't have to drag and drop. I don't have to right click, click copy, right click, click paste. I just go here and click other pane. And then when I do that, bingo. My pCloud presentation is now in my pCloud saved folder. Any device worldwide that can access pCloud now has access to that presentation. <clears throat> and this has worked out great because uh, before I was using pCloud, I had another one and I went out to one of our conferences in Las Vegas. And if I had had a problem with my presentation, I could have gone back to from right there up to the cloud and got the, a copy of the presentation. It works easy. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, between any kind of computers. And I will have to say, Judy, that I do, I can do this with my <clears throat> Windows computer because Windows computer can in, uh, have in a pCloud installed. So I can, I can do that um, easily between any uh, a computer. And so pCloud makes it really easy. Not that I don't like the command line. Yes, I do. Uh, but for the for people who aren't used to using the command line or not ready, this makes it so easy. And since it's a free service, you can get a small one that you could just use for uh, file transfers and accessing it files that way. Now, another way that you can use it, and it's a little bit better because both the um, Warpinator and pCloud is one direction. I send the file up to pCloud's folder, then I go to another computer and access it. Same with Warpinator. I send the file to the other computer and it's there. But we've talked about any desk, team viewer, and a few of these others, remote access that we use to get help or give help to people far away from us maybe. <clears throat> but you can also use any desk right here in your own house with your computers. And so remember I told you, I wanted you to make sure that you, you notice my pant, there's the uh, bars for the, uh, uh, the big bridge. So this is any desk connected to my 
tower. So the any desk around the edge, that's the laptop. And then the smaller version is my desktop. And so now, even though I'm sitting <clears throat> not too many feet away, I can access the other computer from here. So I want to you know, exchange some files. Up at the top, there's a little a lightning bolt. And for the Windows version of any desk, <clears throat> that is your additional, um, additional menu. And when you click on that, you get your file manager. And again, everybody, we should all know how to use file managers. Excuse me. So when I click on that, here's what I get. A two-paned file manager. That's why I kind of showed you that uh, before with mine. So you kind of had a preview of this. On the left is my device, which is the laptop. On the right is the remote device, which is my uh, tower. And I have complete access to every file. Uh, those people who uh, understand a little bit more, you'll notice that I have some grayed out files that uh, have dots in front of them. And that's the way you hide files and folders. You put a dot in front of the name. But notice that any desk accesses everything. You have the permission to see all those hidden files. So on the left-hand side, all of my folders, <clears throat> we happen to be starting in the home folder for uh, both computers. And you'll notice that uh, both my computers, my users are the same because that really helps out when you're using command line and the, uh, the SSH that uh, Orv and then Dave was talking about today uh, that I don't have to remember uh, usernames. I just, just have to remember computers. So if I want to transfer something, it, it's, it works just too easy. On the left-hand side, you just navigate like we know how to do uh, in, in the uh, uh, computer, in the file manager. Up on the left, there's the same buttons that we've had ever since we started computers where the uh, uh, up button and the back button and the home button. So I navigated into my documents folder and found a file that I wanted to send to my other computer. On the right-hand side, then I went and navigated to where I wanted to go, and I created a folder. Uh, there's a button up here that says you can create folders, and I created a folder called work Workshop Example. And then, because I'm here sending my file up through the cloud, actually, it's just through the network. I'm not going up to the cloud because I'm on the network. I use the upload button because I'm on this side. So I'm upping it to my other computer. And then when we do that simple thing, all of a sudden that file shows up on my tower. Real simple. And what I like about um, any desk, it also has a running account of what I've done. It said over here, I was transferring the recycling event and it uploaded and finished fine. The nice thing about any desk versus the first two that I did was that I can do the reverse. I can go on the right hand side, find a file that I want or folder navigate to the location, select it. On the left-hand side, find the location that you want to drop it in, and then switch to the download button because I want to download this from that pretend computer that's up in the cloud, download it. And so when I click it that quick, because I'm in my own network, there it is. There's the file I want. And on the right-hand side, you can see that continues a list of what I've done. I've downloaded this file and it's finished. How can that be any you know, more easier? Can't, you know, can't, can't be. So here are three different, excuse me, 
three three different software GUIs that will let you transfer files. And the only reason that somebody might want to use AnyDesk or uh, Team Viewer, one of the others that does, but it has to include a file exchange program, is that I can do it both both ways. I don't use this as much because usually, like I did said, you know, I worked on the presentation on the desktop and then I wanted it on the laptop. So uh, uh, pCloud is what I used. Now I have a choice that I could use uh, Warpinator too. I'm going to finish just since we're talking about remote file and just do a comment about the SCP. Now, when you watched uh, Dave he did some CP copying files within his directory. When you go from a computer to a computer, you're going to do the SCP, the secure copy, but it's not a GUI. But it works just great. Orv will tell you that when he turns his mic back on later and says, yep, it works great. Uh, but we'll also tell you that Orv is going to be working on a new uh, method of transferring that he's going to do in a future workshop because somebody is always trying to make things new and improve. So the SCP along with that uh, IP config or IF config that he said has been deprecated, which is a nasty sounding word, just means that somebody's come up with a newer one that does better and work. So you can still use it, but why not use the new modern one? So SCP is, is kind of like the older one going out, but it's the one that I learned to do and talk. And all I'm going to do is talk about the basics of what it does and, and not go into big detail uh, because it's the same thing that we that that uh, sort of what uh, Dave was talking about, that when you do a, an SCP, you're going to pick a, a file but you have to tell what where the path of the file. And then you have to tell where it's going to go, the user that's going to get it, and then where do you want to plant it. So we got a path to the file, who's going to receive it, and where are you going to put it. If we add a minus R after the SCP, then you can move folders. Minus R means recursive. So in everything that's inside that, they'll move it. Uh, so as an example to sending a file, and I, I've been taught this. So I, I say, hey, I can do this now. And I can go from uh, any of my computers. And we were also learning this because uh, <clears throat> up until recently, uh, we have a 12 computer Linux lab. And we can send files back and forth to each other. So we've learned to do that. And so here would be the example that I'm going to SCP and I'm going to take a file from my home user's video folder called funnyvideo.mp4. This would be on one line, but it's too long. So it's, it's crossing two. And I'm going to send it to the user at a different computer. So I have to know the IP address. And I'm going to put it in their home user's video file. Now, when you look at that and you'll say, gee, when I saw how it worked in Warpinator and in pCloud, <clears throat> it was just kind of like click, 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 click. Well, that's the way the GUIs work. But for somebody who gets really good and used to uh, uh, terminal and, and commands, uh, you can... There's a lot of shortcuts that we talk about in filling out what, it, what you're wanting to, to uh, type. It, it'll fill it out for you. But that shows you how it does it. And then if I would do a, uh, go to that user and do an LS to see what's there, we would find that in their home user's video folder was now a funny video uh, MP4. And from the same computer, which is what the AnyDesk is doing, uh, Actually, I bet, I'm guessing that that's what's in the background of any desk. It's using the SCP forward and backwards. Um, it's just the opposite. If you want to receive a file, you just kind of flip the order. Again, uh, adding a minus R will let you uh, move a whole folder. But first, you have to say, who's going to send me the stuff? Where, where is that person? 
how do I get to the file they want? And where do I want it to go when it gets here? And down at the bottom, you can see I just flipped the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> order. I'm SCPing to that other computer, that user at 192.168, and I'm going into their home user videos folder, and I want the funny video uh, MP4, and I want it to be downloaded to my home user video. <clears throat> now, we'll tell you that there's a lot of, you know, like shortcuts. If I wanted to do it real quick and dirty, I would just have put a period or dot, sorry, sorry, or dot. I would have had a space after the MP4, put a dot, and that told the computer, just put it in my home folder. I wanted it in the video folder, so I just type it out. And that easy, files get transferred. And if in a future class, we would do it where uh, you can send multiple files at a time and receive multiple files at a time. And there's some other things that you can do with the SCP. And uh, Orb's going to find out and teach us that there's multiple things you can do with the um, SFTP. Yeah, I think that's the new one. So. That is a quick uh, tour of easy graphical user interface um, programs that you can use to transfer files <clears throat> within your own network. Perfect timing. So we'll come back and see what else we can talk about. Judy, any kind of questions from that? Um. Yes, <laughs> I'll be with you in a moment. Okay, I'm going to take a drink. Is P Cloud similar to Dropbox? And are P Cloud and AnyDesk free? Oh, did they not see who that user is over on the other one making the presentation? Oh, I know. Well, I think the person who has that is a new person. That's right. I'm free, John. So just about everything that I talk about, I always start out with free stuff. So yes, um, first question, is it like Dropbox? I would have to say a lot better. Dropbox <laughs> has a lot of restrictions and um you don't get much for what you get. Uh, so I, I recommend pCloud. pCloud is, is more secure with stuff. It's one of those Switzerland-based uh, places. Uh, so it is similar to Dropbox. Judy uses iDrive. It's similar to... Could I use pCloud instead of iDrive? And, and, and Judy, to be honest, the, the reason uh, I don't use the iDrive is that it's basically for Windows and to use it on a Linux machine, there's a lot of hoops you have to go through. It's all background and it doesn't have a client that installs. I can't do what you do and simply copy over like I did with pCloud. And uh, yes, I, I have, uh, if I showed you my uh, pCloud, I have a uh, backup of, of all the files on my tower. And then I have a folder that I can put files in that don't get backed up, but are, can be shared. And th th they all have a, a uh, uh, any desk is totally free. pCloud, you can have uh, up to about so many gigs of uh, storage for free. And then uh, they have a, a small, I think I'm at 400 or 500 maybe. And then they've got a couple terabytes, but I don't need two terabytes with all that I have. So yeah, uh, I, I have twenty four thousand things that I drive. How how many terabytes do you use? Uh, well, I have several. But I don't even use one. Yeah, I it, I looked at that when I was trying to do it, and and P P Cloud has and and uh, uh, I got Mike to to go with P Cloud. Uh, they they have a lifetime that's a real kicker, but 
my problem is I'm going, I don't know how much lifetime I have. So I just pay by the year, like $49 for, you know, four or 500 uh, gigabytes of storage. Uh, but yes, oh. it's free. Got it. Thank you. And Warpinator is oh. free because it comes with, with that. Uh, and uh you can you can do the same thing with with uh, TeamViewer because they have a file sharing program, but I've kind of left TeamViewer because they kind of deprecated some of the tools and features in TeamViewer for Linux users. What is the name of the file manager you are using? My file manager, which you didn't see, is uh, uh, Kaja C A J A, which is very similar. The, the Linux uh, uh, Mint uses three different ones. In, in the Cinnamon one, it's Nautilus. In mine, I use Mate, it's Kaja. And in the uh, XFC version, it's Thun, uh, Thun, Thunar. And, you know, uh, the GNOME one is, is Files. And each one has a different name because there's a slight difference in them. And if they all were called file manager, you don't know which one you're using. Like learning a foreign language. Yeah, but, but a lot of those are just generic file managers uh, for the file transfers. That wasn't, you weren't seeing my, my uh, file manager in my Mint. You were seeing the file manager in any desk. Um, and I think the file manager that I didn't show you in Warpinator was just a generic Here's your files, and and uh, which one do you want to send? Can pCloud restore older versions like the Windows file history? Yes. Okay. I haven't done that, but it it has a uh, it keeps it for a while. You can pay pay to keep old files for a year, like time. But yeah, there's some revisioning in there. Okay, and I'll answer this one. Uh, yes, AnyDesk works on Windows and probably works on Macs also. And it works on your your uh, tablets and your phones. Okay. And AnyDesk also works on Raspberry Pis. Oh, how cl cute is that? Uh, what kind of transfer rates do you get from Warpinator? I just love that name. Yeah. Typically, I find Linux file transfer of large files is very slow compared to, ooh, Windows. I don't have any problems. You, you're going, it, I'm, I'm only limited by my internal network here because it's not going outside. It's just going right through to there. So I haven't seen any big problems with, you know, Mine, we'd have to check with Orv, who who's, does more file transferring with all of his out to the towers and across the valleys and stuff. Um, and, and he's living the good life someplace else right now. He's probably climbed his antenna. <laughs> uh, Dave Melton. Yes. Windows has, op you're going to have to put your Windows hat on too, please. Okay. Windows has options for using different SMB versions. How would this affect your server? Um, it, it actually doesn't uh, because the SMB portion of Windows is really not involved. I'm, I'm doing all my sharing from Samba, which is installed on Linux. All I'm doing from Windows is opening File Manager. And whatever is allowed in File Manager is what I can do. Does that make sense? Yes, I, I, I know that I know that when you look at options, uh, th there are two or three options that are SMB 1.1, 2, and 3, I think. But th those are if I was sharing files from Windows as opposed to from Linux. Thank you. John, I have no more questions in the chat box. Okay. Open it up. Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that that uh, in following up with with uh, Orvs, um, networking, you can go uh, to any kind of extreme you want. I have to thank uh, Kurt for his excellent presentation he did on the headless uh, Raspberry Pi, because I now have one hooked up over there. There's no keyboard and stuff, so I have to use a program like uh 
uh, virtual network con uh, connector VNC uh, to get it, but then I can you know work on it. But it sits over there, and I've placed the uh, Pi Hole program on it, so it's acting as my uh, kind of as my DNS and filtering out lots of junk. So on my network, where uh, Orv showed you about where the DNS was, and he's using the 888 from uh, Google, I would probably use the uh, one either from Open uh, uh, SSA or Open DNS or the Cloudflare, which is the one to use. But my DNS servers are, all the computers are sent to my Raspberry Pi and the Raspberry Pi then goes out and gets everything, pulls it in, filters it out. And Kurt, thank you so much. Um, now yeah. what I need now what I need to do is get room for another Pi and do what Dave did and make a, a server on there. And yeah. if he hadn't done that presentation, that poor little Raspberry Pi would be sitting all lonesome where it was gathering dust. It was in a box. It, it sat all through the uh, pen, uh, pen, uh, the uh, COVID situation because I didn't know what to do with it. But when okay. he showed me that. All right. So uh, what that, I, I have one other thing here. I had uh, something from Ungerman. I was going to put in the uh, follow-up email, but he wants you to know that Warpinator is available as a flat pack. And I will include the link for that in the follow-up email. Now, unfortunately, he forgot to mention that Ubuntu have. people probably can't do it because they don't, Ubuntu doesn't like flat packs. They want you to do everything in snap packs. But yeah. as I said, uh, uh, ah, he's open said source. All Linux distros. All Linux. Okay. All Linux. I'm surprised. Ubuntu doesn't like to play well with everybody. They like to do it their way. Maybe um, they're learning. Yeah, they have to. There's a bigger world out there. Um, but that's, again, for new people, too, that are happen to be here. Linux is based on the concept of open source, which means everybody sees how programs are made, and everybody is more than welcome to take that and rebuild it how they want. <clears throat> so if, if uh, uh, they've done that, they've made a flat pack version that will go on these other computers, that's great. So now, you know, all of you can do something with that. I have a question. Uh uh, okay. One, oh, Dave, of course. I, I have one more comment. Uh, somebody asked a question earlier about my presentation and being uh, uh, command line challenged, I think is how they put it. Um, just to let you know that in the material I'm going to send Judy, I have all the commands that I typed in the presentation. So you will have my list of the 12 commands I used as well as the configuration file I used for your use or whatever. So yeah. there you go. Right, and, and I would add a little to that by saying that uh, these workshops are for all levels. And so we try to cover uh, all levels with different parts of the presentation. Once in a while, we'll have strictly a uh, Linux for beginners. We'll probably have one of those coming up in another month or so. So that's why we did. Dave do his thing and Orv and then the less challenged ones, that's what I did for you so that, you know, you can come away from here sharing files. That's because you taught elementary school. That's probably true. Okay, so I will. Kurt, just raise your hand, okay? <clears throat> he can talk now there. Do, do, do. Alex, you're on. Okay, uh, another program that's available on almost all Linuxes, and it's also available on Windows and Mac for sharing across your home network, is NitroShare. And NitroShare is very simple to use. You open it on both machines, and it stays, in my case, on my toolbar. And when I click on it, it tells me there's another NitroShare user on the network with it open. I right mouse click a folder and transfer, it goes right away. So it's a very simple program. Sounds very similar to Warpinator. So I'll yeah, you can do some configuration, but you don't need to. It 
the default settings work perfectly. Yeah, it'd be fun to go in and find out uh, if Warpinator did come off of uh, this one. Uh, what you sent me, it's called Nitro, Nitro Share. Share. Yeah. yeah, and to see, you know, who who was who came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, <laughs> Nitro Share or Warpinator? Thanks, because my whole thing is there's not just one thing you can use. Right especially with Linux, you know, we've got a hundred different distros or more and tw 15 or so different desktops. So use that. And Nit John, since that didn't come to me, will you spell it for me? Nitro, N-I-T-R-O. <laughs> Nitro, S -S 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 -E. Thank you. Nit Nitro. And Kurt is going to share another one that I've heard of. <laughs> uh, I do not do this on a Linux system that is in my home network, but uh, I support a number of websites and we uh, run on Linux servers at a, from, a, from a hosting company and regularly use a program called FileZilla, F-I-L-E-Z-I-L-L-A. Ah, yep. Okay. Uh, there are both client and server versions of that. I presume that on a Linux system, it's pretty simple to install as a server. And then you put a client on whatever machine you want to run at. Uh, and you have a graphical interface to move files back and forth. Uh, I do that regularly when I'm updating websites and I'll move 1300 files at a time. You know, it's just taking and add something to, to the queue and letting it rip. Uh, It'll go at a speed that is, that is limited by, by two things. One of them is my network upload speed, if I'm moving things to, to an account. And the other one is some overhead that is involved because when I'm doing these file transfers, I have a lot of small files. And when you're moving small files, there's a certain amount of overhead well, for any file. There's a certain amount of overhead that, that is involved in initiating the transfer and then, you know, the, the length of time to actually do the transfer is dependent upon the file size. So small files take a relatively long period of time just because of the, the overhead, but it's a simple interface. It's, um, uh, you know, graphical. It's... It's easy to use. You can queue things. You can move things this way and that uh, pretty easily. Sounds good. I forgot it. Yep. FileZilla. My question is, is anybody that's here ever taken one of the Linux thingies and made it their own and added or changed it? What does that mean, Linux thingy? A well, Linux talk change. about anybody can take something a Linux and add things and change things oh, oh, oh. to make it their own. That's the thingy, Dave. Come on. Oh. <laughs> Why are you asking that question? You it's should a technical term. That. Sorry. You got that. You missed my technical term. <laughs> Has anybody done that? <clears throat> I've just, just, just customized, you know, to my likings what I'm doing. Um, and then, you know, with Mint, there's a program that you can uh, save that ISO or ISO uh, that you've created and then use that to uh, install so that all your customizations and all your additions are already in that loadable one. So that's about the most I've done. I've not, uh, I'm not a programmer, so I don't get into the programs and, and uh, you know, change those. Uh, most I do would be to take a config file and make some changes there. So your answer is yes, but it's just for you. Yep. Kurt, have you done that just for you? No. Darn. No, me either. How about Craig? Nope. What about your, not even with your mirror? Yeah, he, he uses that. You, you can unmute. There you go, Craig. I know. I um, minimally have done that, but not really. 
Okay. Well, and I was going to point out that uh, you forgot to talk about FileZilla, but that's been talked about now because that's the one I use all the time. Yeah, that's clients run on Linux, Mac, and Windows, so it's super easy to use across your entire platform. Cool. Apparently, there's a member of the Brookdale Computer User Groups Linux group who rewrites Linux programs. Perhaps I should attend that and ask my thingy question. Yeah. <laughs> and call it a technical term first. I, Kurt, I, can, I can ask him next month. Would you please? Uh, remember yeah, a, couple of, that thingy. a couple of quick, quick comments. Uh, with regard to uh, using FileZilla and, and whatnot. Uh, I have taken and set up accounts on a, uh, from a host for a particular user of mine, okay? And given them credentials, you log in with this user ID and this password and you can do whatever you want, but they only see one little folder that I put out there just for them, uh, works very well. And, and John made a comment about putting up another Raspberry Pi to put a, a different type of server, a file server on it, okay, or file, file sharing. You can, you can run multiple server functions on a single instance of Linux, a single Raspberry Pi. It doesn't have to be dedicated to running Pi-hole or running file, you know, a Samba server. It can do both. Okay, good. I just have to have enough storage. You just right. have enough resources, whatever that happens to be. Yes. You, do have, you do have to be careful about security when you run multiple hosts because you have to open extra holes in your firewall. <gasps> so be careful of that when you're running multiple ones on the same host. But if you have a firewall that prevents you from leaving your network or people from outside your network getting in, it's not probably a major problem if it's just on your local network. John, yes. you created an ISO of Mint. Is there a link or a video for reference? On how to do that? Yep. You go to the menu and you hit the button that says make it. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it, that comes embedded in Mint. Could you show us? Yeah. Thank you. Do, 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 do. If I can find it there. If I go to my menu. Okay. See if I can find it real quick. Not time shift. <clears throat> of course, I won't be able to find it when I'm looking for it. Well, if you stop sharing, I can have the next person ask a question and then you can come back when you find it. Do, do, do. Oh, somebody said date decade decades ago he wrote a program to transfer files from DAT, D-A-T tapes. If you are working with tapes, that did have to be way back in the day. Tom, you're on. Unmute yourself, please. Uh, not only did I, I've set up a Samba server to, on a Raspberry Pi to uh, serve my music files, but I also have an AFP, uh, Apple File Protocol, server that is running my Time Machine backups, and uh, <clears throat> that that is connected to all of my computers. Uh, not the Linux computer, because the, apparently the two of them don't, the, there is no direct equivalent for Time Machine on the Linux uh, Ubuntu program or platform. 
Thank you. Virgil. Yeah, for all us dummies out here, now that I know how to share files between networks, how do I set up a network? Oh, what a good idea. I think I'll add that to my list. Yeah, that was that was something I had given some thought to before I started sharing this, the, doing the Samba presentation. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a step ahead here. Four ideas, not too shabby. Well, nobody ever has any ideas. Yeah. Well, for, for Virgil, I'd tell him right now, all you need to do is what we did today with those programs until you're ready to go into command line and do a network that way. Because when you, when, when you use the Warpinator, because you have Mint, if you have a second one, Warpinator software that just automatically connects, makes a network without you doing anything. Any desk connects and makes kind of a network without you doing anything other than running those programs. The big network is if you're gonna have a full bunch of computers like we have in our lab, Virgil's one of my guys, that, that you're going to be able to be connect, wanting to connect to multiple computers, then you set up a network. And basically, it's, it's what we talked about today. You set each, you can set each computer to a specific IP address, and then you go connect to them. But right now, for you, I tell people, stick with Warpinator, stick with uh, AnyDesk, stick with uh, uh, Nitro, stick with FileZilla. You know, that was ways you connect to files. Networking is a little bit beyond what most people do in the big networking part. Um, Judy, the program, it's, it's not much to show because we've talked about it before. It's just a USB image maker. I know, and, but if you show him where it is. Oh, it's just USB image maker in, in the uh, Mint. Could we see it with our eyeballs? You know how I am. If it excites you, yes. No, I'm a visual person. Do, do, do. USB image writer makes a bootable USB disk. What image do you want? Where do you want it to go? Yeah. So that it, you know, that's what's so neat about it is that the uh, uh, okay for you MX. two guys. I hope that was enough. Thank you so much. Well, part of it is the program like M M MX Linux, which I really really like, uh, has a program specially designed for it that it once you make your computer it takes that image and puts it on a thumb drive um, so that's the the program if you want to do something like that i would use that one and i do have to say about thumb drives i was talking with bill james about this last night um when they say gee i do backing up on my flash drive and to me that's a horror story because I recently have had two flash drives that went south. They only had data on it, but they got all sticky and gummy and yucky and horrible. And so luckily we're having an e-waste, a Dave Melton e-waste event on Saturday over, yep. over at Via Princesa train station on my side of town, nine to two. And uh, they dead in a doornail. So number one, don't use your flash drives for backing up and don't think if you, you, you know, do an image thing that it's going to maybe last forever because they do get crummy. And I noticed that Craig went. That especially is true, it's especially of true of older USB drives that you've used a lot. When I was teaching, I used to get a new one about every year because they get unreliable after you've used them a bunch. I, but yes, they can just fail out of the blue and you're, you're pretty yeah. much whatever was on there, kiss it goodbye. I had a flash drive for each student uh, teaching Word, so they didn't create the documents. They just had to edit them and they learned how to, you know, take what was on the flash drive and put it on their hard drive in a Word you know, folder. And uh, I use them three times a year. 
and every once in a while there'd be nothing there yeah <laughs> you know they could have done something wrong uh, and another it would be totally corrupted so they do not like cds and dvds they really don't sometimes last forever they wear out yeah they get tired just like we do I, were. you were reading my mind <laughs> anyway it's sticky, sticky electrons yes <laughs> we have any more questions outstanding presentations as usual very thorough and I didn't catch Cal. I was going to ask him if he had any words of wisdom before he left. And I think he is gone. Yeah, he's gone. He, he said he was going to be just sitting in the background because that was an area that he uh, was an expert on. And I would have to say, I'm not. Cal or Dave probably will say, I'm not. Or <laughs> he probably is. But yeah. we, hey. It's the idea that we're we're willing to take the step and say, well, here's what we know and what we've learned. We'll share it with you. And maybe you think we sound like experts, but not always. And and they are warts and all. So feel free to say, you know, I think I'd like to be on a panel one time and give a little mini presentation about some kind of thingy. Well, and it's the, something as simple as Kurt just, and both Kurt and Craig said, I use FileZilla a lot. Okay, show us how, show us, do a little demo on that. You I know, also use SCP a lot too. Okay, and like I said, Orv's going to teach us the new one with the F, uh, SFTP, which is, he said, it's what he saw has some really extra features. Yeah. But if there is something that you do that we haven't talked about that you think others might be interested in, share it with us. Let APCUG's overall umbrella says, user groups helping user groups, users helping users. You know, I learned some stuff today. I didn't know anything about Samba other than I thought that was a, a dance that you did with the drums and all. Um, but I like that one much you. better. You do? Okay. <laughs> and so he, he taught. And, he, and I got to tell Dave that he he even went more than what I didn't think he'd do. I said, that's, I was impressed. He, he really did it well. So if, if there's things that, that, that you, uh, uh, that you have used that we haven't talked about, well, add it, you know, we're not expecting expert teachers because if we were, I would not be here because, I go to the, I've sat in on the Boston's Linux group, which is not a member of APCUG. And they're like, here. Oh. And they, they're a group that meets at MIT. So that's got to tell you something. <laughs> now, Brookdale, that's a great group. Boston. Whew. Yeah. So. And I do have a comment. Beware of where you're getting your thumb drives from. And make sure that, oh my gosh, that is such a great deal. I'm getting a whole box of flash drives for a little amount of money. And I can remember the president of UCHUG under the Computer Hood User Group in San Diego used to say that, that he would go to Fry's back in the day. Oh, I miss Fry's. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there'd be this big sale and you wouldn't touch them with the 10 foot pole. Yeah. Or, or the one that Dave Williams got and brought to us at uh, Florida, it was like a five gig terabyte or five terabyte thumb drive for ints dollars. And when you ran it, it only could hold 200 megs, you know? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Mine, um, works, mine works just fine. Thank yep. you. It, it, oh, it works, but it's not as big no, as they claim. I mean, yeah. Really, it's as big as they claim. Sorry. Maybe. I, it, yep. And this is even the lanyard that somebody at the Florida conference was giving out. Oh, because the ones we got did not have that full capability. I, I do. I, the I, only I, one that did. Only one that did. I guess that's why. I do want to make a plug because he, he's sitting right here. Uh, next week, our uh, work Wednesday, Wednesday workshop is an Apple workshop. Wow. For Linux today, next week. 
tell all your Apple people. Craig Wright is one of our presenters for next week. And uh, we've got a couple of others. It's going to be a really good one with a multiple. So Apple people, tell your Apple people, get themselves out of here because we we do it. We're not just a Windows. We're a Windows, Linux, and Apple. So you want me to show up next week? I, I would oh, really appreciate that. <laughs> John's even got your bio for Pete's sake. If you're not here, he's reading it anyway. And yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Well, tap, and tap. and again, and Deborah will be here as well, just like you've seen in the past. Yeah, that's great. We're going to have two people from two different locations. Plus, we have two other people. So we've got really a three-part uh, Apple presentation. So you don't want to miss that. Brooke, and Rookie yeah. from the Central Computer. Rookie, yeah, right. Rookie. Be here, and she will doing be doing the map flyover feature. And she just got back from a month in Florida and Germany. And we will have a new presenter um, who made the mistake of volunteering. And he's also on the Speakers Bureau with uh, Apple type presentations. We haven't had any of that since Jerry Minnick left. And he's going to be talking about Apple's version of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, just little nip tips of that. Those are, and it's all about Apple apps. And then another time we are going to compare iPhone versus Samsung. And then I want to have uh, the uh, iHealth apps versus the uh, Samsung health apps, a comparison of, you know, what you get with your phones and your watches and things like that. And as always, if you have other ideas of workshops, uh, we're probably in August can only have two workshops because we have oh, a Saturday. We're in September. Yep. Well, you know, we got two workshops in, in uh, August because we got a Saturday uh, safari and then we'll be back in November or September, July, October, September. Yep. And then, and then in November, we'll have a Saturday workshop, which will be including our annual uh, meeting. So a lot coming up, but we can always make room for more people uh, to help in presentations. And, you know, all you need to do is tell Judy, I'll do a little bit and she'll find somebody else. She'll figure out a way to tie it all together and, uh, you know, put, you know, for you don't have to do two hours. For this presentation that I'm doing next week, Judy, what she did is she almost broke my arm to get me to do this. All the <laughs> she, way from SoCal to Columbus. And she's darn good at it. Yes, <laughs> she is. And actually, she said, would you mind doing this? I mean, yeah, I suppose I could do that. That's about how hard she had to twist. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's the kind of thing that once he did it once, then... Well, you've already done it, so why don't you go do it for this group and then this group? Yeah. Uh, next week will be the fourth time I've done this presentation, so. <laughs> and it's a darn good presentation, too. Thank it, you. Is, it is. From the from, from a Linux guy, it, it was interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so beware. <laughs> if I attend your meeting and you uh -huh. are giving a presentation, that's how I find. That's how she did me and Deborah's. Well, the other way is that those of us who are advisors and we read newsletters and we read about different workshops, we pass that on to Judy and say, hey, somebody did a really neat workshop for their group or program. So we contact. So there's somebody on my screen that's going to get contacted. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Dave, I want to thank Dave. I want to thank Bill for being my co-host, taking care of any problems we've had or have had to get off. Cal had to get off and um, oh I have one thing Dave. we will not be here we will not be in Linux will not be here in August because of the Saturday Safari and we are taking all of the stuff that we got from those polls that we did and we are going to be having a big planning session and we're looking for trying to do workshops in sep uh, August September October November we won't have one in December for sure because that's Christmas week. So we're looking to try to put together three more workshops, but we can always have suggestions and help. And um, Melton, yeah. when were you putting your presentation to together? Before, during, or after COVID? Um, I was putting it together basically during COVID. I, I, 
I had the ideas before I got COVID. And then since I wasn't doing anything else <laughs> and, and, and felt like crap, I, I figured I would sit down and put it together. So see, if you happen to get COVID and you Lucky have me. an idea for a presentation, there you're home, you can't go any place. Prop yourself up in front of your computer and go for it. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> I need I would, for a seg into a, why don't you give a presentation? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I did my thank yous to all the people, and of course, to Judy for taking care of all the questions and, and uh, filtering those for the presenters so they don't have to worry about that while they're trying to present. I'd like to thank all of you for attending today and look forward to uh, future Wednesdays uh, at both Linux and in the other ones. And uh, have yourselves a safe day and try to stay cool.